Hello everyone. In this lecture, I want to talk to you about deductive arguments. Let's review what we have covered in this class so far. An argument gives reasons for believing that something is or is not the case. As you remember, an argument consists of two parts: premises and a conclusion. There are two types of arguments. The deductive argument states that if the premises are true, the conclusion has been proven or demonstrated. The inductive argument states that if the premises are true, the conclusion has been supported. This lecture is about deductive arguments or reasoning. When studying deductive arguments, it is helpful to know their forms or patterns. The argument form is determined by words such as all, some, no, not, either or, if then. Take for example all or some. We can make sentences using all and some. We can assert all fours the car maker. All fours are cars. Some fours are cars. Some fours are not cars. And no fours are cars. Sentences using all, some, not, no are known as categorical statements. Categorical statements express the the categories. Cars belong to one category. Fours, the American、uh, car maker, belongs to another category. There is a logic known as categorical logic. Invented by Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher who lived in the fifth century B.C., about twenty-five hundred years ago, categorical logic deals deals with syllogisms such as this: all dogs are mammals, all mammals are warm-blooded, and all dogs are warm-blooded. Categorical logic is very useful and was taught in schools, including colleges and universities, and they are still taught. In schools and colleges and universities, even today. However, at the turn of the twentieth century, mathematicians and philosophers thought that we need to improve upon Aristotle's categorical logic. So they invented other logical systems, such as propositional or sentential logic, predicate logic, modal logic, and so on and so forth, which is really the foundation of computers, computing, and computer science. We can also devise statements and arguments using and, either or, if then, and not, and we'll see those arguments、uh, in the argument forms shortly. One thing to remember is that our argument form or argument forms are distinct from argument content. The form has to do with the sentences or an argument's structure. The content is what the sentence or an argument expresses. Uh, so both are important, but they are different. Studying deductive argument can be beneficial for analyzing ordinary language. So although we speak and communicate in English, the English language contains sentences that are vague and ambiguous. Studying deductive arguments can help us analyze those sentences better. Studying deductive argument will enable you to think. Clearly, precisely, conceptually, and abstractly, and can enable you to write clearly and precisely. And those are very valuable skills to develop in college. One thing to remember is that deductive arguments give us certainty, which is a very valuable commodity in today's uncertain world. However, deductive arguments generally do not give new knowledge. In what follows, I wish to examine several deductive argument forms or patterns. The first is the disjunctive syllogism. Now, the word disjunction means either or. Syllogism is an argument with two premises and one conclusion. Let's consider an example. Either Ralph walked the dog, or he stayed home. He didn't walk the dog, therefore he stayed home. 
This is a disjunctive syllogism because there is a disjunction in the first premise, either or. This is a syllogism because the argument has two premises and one conclusion. The form of a disjunctive syllogism is as follows. Uh, either P or Q, and so this expresses a disjunction. And then the second premise always denies either P or Q. So not P, therefore Q. Now notice that P's and Q's are variables, and we can fit in whatever uh, content that we want when making an argument. So let me illustrate disjunctive syllogism with two fun examples. The first example comes from the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which was written by C.S. Lewis and made into a movie a few years ago. In the book, Peter, Susan, and Edmund are wondering if their sister Lucy's claim that she went into this magical place called Narnia is true or not. So they consult a professor. The professor admonishes them that through logic, they can figure out whether Lucy is telling the truth or not. So this is what the professor says. Logic, said the professor said to himself. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister Lucy is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it is obvious that she is not mad. For the moment then, and unless other, any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. So more formally, we might say this. Uh, the first premise, either P or Q or R. Well, not P is not Q either, therefore R. So P, so either Lucy lies, or she is mad, or she's telling the truth. Well, clearly Lucy is not a liar, not, not P, and she is not mad, you can see it, therefore Lucy is telling the truth. Another example comes from the movie The Matrix. It is an awesome movie with so many interesting philosophical issues and undertones. Uh, the main character of the movie is this person named Neo. He lives in a computer simulated world called the Matrix. He thinks he lives in a dream world, but he cannot tell for sure. Outside of the Matrix is, in fact, the real world. Morpheus, the person in front of you, rescues Neo from the Matrix because he believes Neo can save humanity by destroying the Matrix. In that process, Morpheus presents Neo with a choice. Uh, you can take the red pill, or you can take the blue pill. If you take the red pill, you are rescued, and you get to know the real world as it is. If you take the blue pill, you go back into the Matrix and believe whatever you want to believe. So based on that example, uh, we can come up with this, uh, this argument. You can either take the red pill or the blue pill. Well, um, I'm not going to take the red pill, so you take the blue pill. Or you might say, well, you can take the red pill or the blue pill. I'm not going to, tell the, I'm not going to take the blue pill, therefore I'm going to take the red pill. And this is what Neo decides. He wants to find out what truth is, what reality is, to get outside of the matrix to free humanity. So my question is this, which one would you take and why? The next deductive argument form or pattern we'll examine is hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical means conditional, so kind of if-then or conditional statements. A syllogism is a deductive argument pattern composed of three statements, two premises, and a conclusion. So let's consider an example. If the ball drops, the lever turns to the right. If the lever turns to the right, the engine will stop. 
and therefore if the ball drops the engine will stop the uh, hypo the hypothetical syllogism form is this if p then q these are variables if p q then r if p right p then r now any argument that follows this pattern is said to be valid and if you recall from the previous lecture validity means this if the premises are true the conclusion has to be true. So in other words, if these first two premises are true, the conclusion must be true by virtue of logic. Next, we have four deductive argument patterns that all contain if-then statements. So consider this argument pattern. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. The first premise is a conditional statement, meaning if then. A conditional statement contains two parts. The if part is known as the antecedent. And then the then part is known as the consequent. This pattern is known as affirming the antecedent because uh, the, the second premise, P, is affirming the antecedent of the conditional statement. Or the fancy term for this is modus ponens. Modus ponens is a valid deductive argument form or pattern. That is, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Any argument that follows this pattern is valid. So in this argument pattern, it says, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Uh, premise one is a conditional statement. P is the antecedent of the conditional statement. Q is the consequent of the conditional statement. In, uh, in P2, in the second premise, we are denying the consequent. So thus, this is known as denying the consequent or also known as modus tollens. Modus tollens is a valid argument pattern, meaning if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So whenever you encounter an argument that follows this exact pattern, you can be assured that it is a valid argument. So now consider this argument, or this argument pattern, I mean. If P, then Q, Q, therefore P. Again, the first premise is a conditional statement, right? P, right, the first part of it is called the antecedent. The second part of it, Q, right, is the consequent. This argument is an invalid, this is an invalid uh, form of reasoning. So affirming the consequent is an invalid form of reasoning, meaning even if the first two premises are true, it does not guarantee that the conclusion has to be true. So this argument pattern says this, if P then Q, again this is a uh, conditional statement, P antecedent, Q the consequent, but notice that in the second premise we are denying the antecedent. You're denying the antecedent and therefore you're denying the consequent. So this is a fallacy. This is an invalid way of reasoning. So whenever you see an argument that follows this pattern, you can safely assume that it is that they will be invalid arguments. So I have summarized the discussion in the past four slides in this chart. So I recommend that you first kind of think through the logic behind each form of deductive reasoning and memorize the pattern until you get familiar with the valid and invalid argument patterns. So let me conclude with um, this fun example from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Now, on page 23, Alice says this, I am sure I am not Ada, she said, 
for her hair goes in such ring, long ringlets, kind of long hair, and mine doesn't go in long ringlets at all. And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things. But she, Mabel, oh, she knows such a very little. Based on the text in the previous slide, I have devised four different arguments.、Uh, one, two, three, four. Please read through them and tell me which ones are valid and why, and which ones are invalid and why.